everyone, welcome to the Pole Strong Podcast with me, your host, Becky Dunn. Delighted today to introduce you to the amazing Britt Bloom, a pole and flexibility instructor and a Bendy brand ambassador. Britt, thank you for joining me. Yay! Woo! <laughs> thank you so much. It's late where you are. Yeah, it's nine. It's uh, after classes, so, but it's fine. Have you, ha- have you been teaching all day today? No, no, just one class, actually, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, at the moment, it's uh, uh, as we call it here, it's the summer, the summer hole. So it means it's very low uh, amount of people in the studio. I see. And how how are you since your hip surgery? Um, pretty good. Uh, so it's now um, what am I? I think it's like uh, it's two and a half months. So, Is it? Is it come um, that quick? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, astonishing how many things work, but I'm also, uh, the more I start training, the more I start to meet my limitations that are going to be permanent limitations. So wow. uh, for yeah, which is fine. It's, it was expected. I mean, if you get like a prosthetic hip, uh, it's uh, anything I can, I can get is, uh, is something good. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a learning process. Of course it is. So where did that where did that start for you? When did you know that you have you had your whole hip replaced? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what did you did you always know that was going to have to happen or was it something that um, come, come not as a bit really shocked? it's it's something that babies get tested on uh, at birth. Uh, so right. I, I, what I had is hip dysplasia um and it's just like an anatomical predisposition so i have less bone so to speak um wow in certain areas and um yeah it creates more pressure on the cartilage and therefore it wears down faster and um i never really had problems with this it wasn't no doctors found it out uh, when i was younger and it started appearing just every once in a while in the last couple of years. But as you know, if you train a lot and if you teach a lot, you always have some pain in some area. Yeah. And usually you, you rest a couple of days and then everything's uh, better again. And then we had the first lockdown and uh, I kind of went into survival mode because I wanted to save my studio. So of I course. went full on uh, um, trying to teach as much online classes as I could. So I had like two or three a day. Wow. Six or seven days a week. No, six days a week, five to six days a week. That's a and lot, on top isn't of it? that, it was, yeah. And on top of that, I was training a lot um, because there was nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and that super sped up the process um, of the wearing down. And then it became you know, really quite bad. And I still had to teach my classes. It was still lockdown time, so I still could get any assistance. Um, yeah, and then it got to a point where I literally couldn't uh, walk anymore. <gasps> uh, yeah, and I would rest and hope that it would get better, but the rest also didn't make it a lot better. So then from there, the it started rolling. It must have been uh, difficult yeah. as well when you, I, you know, when you said you identified those niggles that you were starting to get from teaching a lot. Like, you know, when you, you know, as an instructor, when there is pain, and then mm-hmm. when there is like, okay, I need to rest that. Like some things you can push for a little bit and you you know your you know your limits and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then there's times where you're like, no, I I I need to ease off that completely. Mm-hmm. So how was it when you were in lockdown then having to teach? Did you like what sort of pain was it that you were feeling? Was it just restricting your movements or your flexibility? Um, was it was it was it restricting anything? It, well, it was very restricting that's a bit my uh, I wouldn't say my problem but um, um, uh, I would say I'm very stubborn <laughs> and if, if something if something hurts and I know I'm not breaking anything you know I will still I wouldn't push, push through the pain of course but um, I'm not going to stop teaching and um, when I teach I always give it's such a cliche but I give everything and I don't want to do any like half-assed demonstrations so yeah. I'll be like okay I shouldn't be doing this but I'm gonna do it anyway so of course uh, that wasn't that's not a he- very helpful trait uh, um, in, in this situation but um you just want to give the best 
exactly yes and and every day uh, no exceptions and um it was limiting i didn't let it limit me in my uh, classes but it would limit me in everything else so yeah. in doing groceries uh, um, became harder and harder just taking a walk with my friends mm -mm. um wow. yeah at a certain point i was just okay I can't do anything else if I have to teach tonight. I have to make choices. So, yeah, and I remember watching because I remember watching seeing it on Instagram that you had got when you went into hospital to have your surgery, and even watching your recovery. Your cover, your recovery has been quite quick. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's just me, but I, I remember watching some stuff that you were doing, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> just like because you were so obviously you were in control of your body and again it's going back to that you know what you can put your body through and when it's too much but like looking from the outside I was like oh she's still recovering <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know yeah no sorry I I talked so my my dad's an orthopedic surgeon yeah so oh, wow. he, okay. he has been a, a very helpful guide through the process the thing is he lives in Holland, where I am obviously from, and I live in Austria. So he couldn't do my surgery, but he still, you know, provided all the information. And he also, when he saw some of the things I was doing, he was like, Jesus Christ. Please stop, <laughs> you please not, stop. You please not do this. <laughs> uh, um, and that's, um, yeah, that's a little bit difficult. So what I heard from my surgeon and from a lot of other professionals is that my recovery is really very, very quick and very, very uh, I want, yeah, I'm not sure if remarkable is the right word, but it's... Oh, oh my God, it's, yes. It's been insane. It's not a, yeah, it's not a standard, uh, a standard kind of recovery. And I credit my recovery to the fact that I was teaching and training a lot of accessibility. So yeah. um, basically my body was starting to get back to its own strength. And also the, the surgery I had is an approach where they don't cut through the muscles. So they move the muscles aside. They do all this stuff, you know, they, they cut out a massive piece of your joint to put in a whole new um, metal construction. <laughs> um, but the muscles were able to recover faster and that makes it a lot easier uh, uh, to re recover, but still and also, uh, yeah, I'm also still very happy uh, how fast it's well fast, fast yeah no yeah. it has and it's been amazing to watch it really really has so how long have you been doing pole for how long have you been teaching when did it all start for you have you always had a have you always had a sporting um, background as well I, I always did sports but I did all kinds of different sports and nothing was really related to what I ended up doing <laughs> um I've been polling consistently for 10 years oh, okay, and I've been wow. teaching for nine so as a, as a main job I've been teaching it for eight but I started teaching nine years ago and um yeah so 10 10 years and my, my first poll class was like 13 or 14 years ago wow. uh, but back then there weren't any posters yet so I had to wait until the first one opened yeah and it was so different polling back <laughs> then was so different you don't have the half the moves that you that you have now or the reach or you you know the tools that you can have to learn mm -hmm. is is incredible yeah. so how long have you had your studio for um this is my second studio um so my first studio i had for five years and then the corporation with my other two studio owners uh, didn't work so and uh, then I did workshops for a year, which was really nice because I got to travel around a lot, mainly in Austria, Germany, and I met a lot of people, studios and uh, all of that. And then um, now my new studio I have, I keep forgetting, since two, April 2018. So yeah, that's, I'm so bad at calculating, three years. Yeah, a little, a little yeah. over three years. Yeah, but yeah. it's also hard to hard to remember because it's you know I've been one and a half year in uh, in Corona time, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's been a it's been a long time. It hasn't been easy. How has it been mm. in Austria with the lockdown? How because you know a lot of people that I've spoken to so far um have been in the UK and I've spoken to um Ali out in America and America. Mm. I feel like the way America handled COVID was so public. 
what how was it in Austria was it were you locked down how were your studios you know what... uh, I, I think we were one of the first countries to go on lockdown so first was Italy and then was us um, well, I... because especially here in Tyrol you were directly to the Italian border right so it was very fast um yeah <sighs> Well, the first lockdown, it was like still the eerie lockdown. There was no one on the streets. It was like, uh, yeah, it was just like a different dimension. Like uh, probably everybody experienced in their own uh, yeah. lockdown. I think Austria was very, very cautious. And I think they handled it very well. Maybe in some cases it was a little bit... Um, I don't know. I don't know how to explain. Austrians like rules. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dutch, so I can I can I lovingly speak about the Austrians, but uh, um, they like things tidy and well Structure. organized. Yes, and that's also how it went here. And but I think in this situation, this was for sure one of the best countries to be in uh, in in this whole uh, pandemic uh, situation. So. Yeah, but the studios were on lockdown. I've been um, from the, in the past one and a half years. I think I've been closed for nine mm -hmm. months at least. Wow, so pretty much the same as the UK. Yeah. The UK, mm -hmm. we completely shut down as well. It's just mm -hmm. been, it, it has been devastating for so many, for so many businesses. But the way that we all moved online, and I've spoken about this a lot on the podcast so far with different guests. How was it for you to going, going online? Did you do much training yourself or were you very much focused on like getting your studio up and running, making sure that was being driven in, that, that income? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I was, uh, I was very fast. I think I was one of the first starting uh, online classes, not like in general, but as soon as like our lockdown hit, I mm. started, I think, three days later with my first oh, wow. uh, online classes and um yeah that for me was like emergency <laughs> i have to i have to create income i have to save my studio and um which put enormous pressure on me because i had to do it all by myself and like i said i, I was teaching uh, and like the height uh, peak times it was six days a week two to three classes a day plus training it was it was insane it was absolutely crazy do you look back on that now and like, do you think you've learned from that in terms of putting your body through that much or are you, are you happy that you did it? I mean, um, it's done, it's done either way. But, it's done, yes, you know. yes. Well, the prosthetic hip would have been uh, an issue sooner or later anyway. So mm. um, I, I don't regret it that much because I also found a lot of time to train, which was Yeah, really nice. it's always, that's the best, <laughs> the best yes. time. Uh, I didn't have to, you know, worry too much about cleaning my studio, getting uh, stuff <laughs> yeah. in order. Yeah, so it left more time to fo really focus on what I like to do. And it kept me sane in a way that I was still connected to people because yes. especially here, the first lockdown, it was like, there was, there was so isolated mm. and it was so nice to connect every day, uh, you know, people. <laughs> Yeah, I remember, because yeah. I said to my husband, I'm going to buy a pole. I think it's best that I buy a pole for home. And he said, no, 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 don't don't buy one yet, because I think it will only be for two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we all so that, We all, yeah, we did. And um, so I didn't, because I did, I, you know, I remember, I remember leaving for work on the day that we were being, sh the, the day before we were locked down, and being like, well, I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> you know, closing the studio, being like, we'll see you all soon. Don't worry, it won't be for long. Mm -hmm. and, and here we are as a complete, you know, different way of living and, and everything. So are you still continuing online classes now, even yes. though you're back in yeah. the studio? Do you do a yeah. hybrid or do you teach yeah. them separately? Sometimes I, I, I basically tried every format. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, I prefer to have my online and my normal classes uh, separated, but um, since I have only one body, yes. um, I, I still try to, um, at least my flexibility classes are usually hybrid. So sometimes I have more online students, sometimes I have more uh, students in the studio, but um, yeah, for sure. I haven't continued my online poll classes yet because of my hips, mm -hmm. because I'm still recovering. 
spring, but uh, that's going to be yeah, relatively soon. Yeah, and I do I do like the concept. I was a little bit skeptical at the beginning, especially because you can't spot your students, which yeah. has been nerve wracking. It's been nerve wracking to really see has. someone hanging by one toe on the pole. You just like you just want to reach through your screen and catch someone. You can't. But I was also surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised by how well everybody is actually able to manage without a spotter. And I always yes. tell the girls, I'm going to remind you, when you come back to the studio, you can do this by yourself. You don't actually always need me to, you know. No, this is so something. true. But that was a big concern for everyone. I feel like that was probably the big overriding concern <laughs> is that you you can't spot. And also when you're teaching in the studio you can see people's ability like I know that if I'm if I tell one of my students I know you can do this I know they can and it, you know you might like you say you might need to do a spot for a bit of guidance but I truly believe they've got it in them we can see that when it's mm -hmm. online and you're teaching new people that you don't know and you don't know their ability to the full amount I mean my god sometimes you're like I'm going to teach this but please do it if only if you feel safe <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah. it is it was very it was very nerve-wracking <laughs> i said one one student of mine uh uh fell fell <gasps> down there. yeah was she okay Face first yeah she was okay and she still takes my online classes thank <laughs> god but that day i just felt i felt so horrible i felt so horrible yeah but then also my um my uh, ex-boyfriend uh, is like a semi-professional snowboarder and he always um, said so if you fall down you just you know it's part of sports I think that's something we tend to forget that uh, you know it's, of course you want to avoid at all costs that you fall down but if you fall down you're still doing a high-risk sport you know so it shouldn't be like uh, uh, a crisis in your in your pole uh, career it should just be okay fuck I messed up let's try again it's a learning and, uh, curve isn't it I find that with yeah. I actually find it more with hoop than I do with pole but with hoop there's I've, I've fallen off the hoop oh actually and the pole I've fallen off the pole loads but you know you fall off and you learn from it it's mm -hmm. a learning curve I know it can be that shock can't it where you're like shit <laughs> <laughs> am i okay touching every part of your body like what's mm -hmm. broken no but um and you learn from it because you then can that you it, it going back to that point with Nomi, you, where your limits are you mm -hmm. understand your grip points more you know exactly. and so yeah it's reckless yeah <laughs> yeah exactly you know how to control the spin a little bit more that tends to be my thing i just love to spin so much that mm -hmm. then i overspin and that's when that's when the the accidents happen for me. <laughs> so flexibility with you, um, because you are very flexible. So has has that always come quite naturally to you? Not really. So what I did have naturally is a, a relatively, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call it flexible. I just it's also not a deformity I had very bad posture and the bad <laughs> posture uh, led to me having a, a relatively flexible lower back right. which is now my least flexible back part so I had some natural flexibility in my back but mm -hmm. I also lost that as I gained more strength yes uh, especially in the front and yeah. then I uh, worked my way up to back flexibility through strength uh, so active flexibility so what I had naturally is not really what I'm accessing uh, today um, uh, for my back flexi stuff. My legs were not uh, flexible. Front splits, I still hate them. Um, <laughs> middle splits are a little bit better, but um, yeah. yeah. So I, I worked very hard for it. And um, what I do have is my body responds very well to training. So if I do strength training, I build strength relatively fast. If I do flexibility training, then um, my flexibility improves relatively fast. Yeah. So how is your training structured? How do you how do you balance the two? When 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 you get your training time, how do you decide what you're going to train, and and what does that look like? Well, my first question is which self training time? What is that? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. You know those you get those like pockets of time. Like sometimes they're like ten minutes, and I'm like, quick, let's get a video. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. That's training yeah. time. So, yes. So, so for me, it's all basically merged together. Um, 
I used to really train for myself. Um, I physically can't afford to do that on top of my classes and class preparation. Yeah. And I now just fuse my uh, yeah class preparation with my own training. And yeah, I do usually, that. Hmm, usually I end up uh, trying some new stuff and then I say, okay, that's what I'm teaching tonight or this week. Yeah. Basically. And you can still, I was saying this the other day, um, that you can choose really how much or how little you use the equipment during teaching. So if you feel like you haven't trained mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. and you would like to train a little bit more, then, you know, there, there is always that option. Although it doesn't feel like you're training, you're still moving your body and you're still, you know, using your muscles to the same sort of, you know, degree. So mm -hmm. what's your favorite, flexibility or strength? Oh, flex. Uh, in, in combination with strength, active flexibility, I would say. So it's also uh, uh, a lot of strength involved. Yeah, but flex for sure. Yeah. So you said that you build strength quite quickly. Do you, how do you build strength? Do you build that through the studio and on the pole or do you do any form of cross training? Um, I used to, but this is a long time ago. So when I just started full-time teaching, I used to do uh, strength training uh, mm. in addition also to balance out my body and um, to make sure that I could push to the next level because I was still growing as a pole dancer. Yes. Um, and up to the point where I was able to do everything on the pole, I did a lot of strength training. And that was just like, um, um, I did, um, oh, fuck, what's it called? Sorry, um, <laughs> a, a teacher worry, training. Man. I did a, a yeah. teacher training for, for a strength uh, uh, fitness trainer mm -hmm. uh, with the focus on uh, um, prehab. So basically training in such a way that your body is um, not my Dutch is going to come through <laughs> <laughs> that you have less chance for injuries basically yeah. yes because well when you strength train I found this in particular it's something that I do a lot um you strengthen you strengthen the muscle itself and also stabilize the joint mm -hmm. you know you do it prevents injury and like you say it also helps with muscle imbalance mm -hmm. yeah. I mean we we encourage everybody to train both sides always as we instructors always say train both sides mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you always do have a most dominant side don't you so you do yeah. always have those you know slight muscle imbalances or you know whatever that looks like so do you do you block out any time at all for you to train or do you just take it as and when you can I wish I could yeah I take it as and uh, how it comes and the the main factor in that is always my body because I can plan what I want but from day to day the body changes you know there's I mean there's the classes you teach there's maybe the food you eat the stress you're under there's yeah. maybe uh, your your uh, menstrual cycle you know everything yeah. comes into play and I can plan what I want but it's not up to me it's up to my physical state uh, to decide what I'm going to do how much I'm going to do or if I'm not going to do anything at all uh, so I, I kind of gave that up because I found it very very frustrating to try to keep maintaining um something that would sometimes maybe even not wouldn't say cause more harm but you know wouldn't do my body much good yeah well it's that external pressure that you put on yourself as well isn't it where you mm -hmm. have an idea that you want to train and then you have one of those days where like you say where you might be feeling a bit crap or mm -hmm. you haven't eaten enough you're tired there's external stress factors going on and then you're yeah. like Oh, but this is when I said I was going to train. And then it's like a real argument with you and your body. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you have to, you have to prioritize the body. You really do. Yeah. yeah. And that's the only thing where I had like a, I mean, of course, where you have like a, a regime, like a training regime is when you yes. have a, a competition, obviously. And I had, uh, I think I did like one, one and a half year of really, uh, con, uh, consequent consistent consistent <laughs> uh of back flexibility training because i just yeah. wanted to achieve a certain uh, level mm -hmm. and that also meant that three times a week i would train after classes sometimes until midnight or even past midnight wow uh for two and a half or three hours three times a week and um i was super strong i'm not gonna lie like i was really my body was in, in top shape but um 
yeah it's it's it, it you always pay and on one end you know if yeah, you, you if you get a lot of time for your training it means either your social life is crap or or your sleep is shit or uh you don't get it. it's you're always you know it's hard to find a balance yeah, yeah definitely and it's juggling everything as well because not only do you teach and you know, then you have clients, don't you? If, if you have private lessons or online classes or, you know, whatever that might look like, exter again, ex external factors outside of your training world, um, they all take a part. And I think getting that balance right can be quite hard. It takes a little while to to find. And also it's it's what brings you the, ha the most happiness, isn't it? What Finding that, you know, finding that medium. So something I do see on Instagram, I nearly said it on my story today, you know, and I was like, no I can't because anyone that doesn't understand might think this is really weird but where were the little where where were the little quickies born when, no, actually, been doing the little quickies for? <laughs> yeah the quickies were born uh, through my uh, yeah, hip injury because I this is I wanted to train I still wanted to do something every day but uh, it meant that I sometimes could only do something for 10 minutes or 15 minutes so I um I said okay then I'm just going to find very short movements that I still have enough time to repeat and refine it a little bit, take a nice video or to find like the, the, the most, like how it looks, looks the nicest. Um, yeah. But without putting the strain on my body, because like long ass combos where you go from one flexibility trick into the next, uh, that was too much. So yeah, that's how I the love the cookies. I and love apparently them. people like this. Yay! Yeah, because it's <laughs> they're it's, fun because they're so yeah. sweet. Yeah. yeah, like do you know what's the worst? I find anyway. I'm a bit like you. I I only have very very small pockets of time to train. I train on a Saturday, but I still have clients in before. So even that training time on a Saturday can sometimes be compromised if I'm not feeling up to it or I'm tired. You know, I don't actually get a solid. You know, mm -hmm. I'm free. This is when I'm going to train. And um, sometimes when you're looking at stuff to do. And then you're like, oh, no, I need to warm up my splits for that. I need to warm up my back for that. I, I tell mm -hmm. you, I'm a big fan of, I've said this before as well. I really like Polnick because mm -hmm. he does very, very similar stuff. You, you know, you, that's, that's where I like to get my inspiration from. Really short movement, mm -hmm. dynamic, quite strength based, bit flowy. I love it. I'm here yeah. for it. Yeah. We all love them. <laughs> we all love your quickies. <laughs> so your lifestyle then because it sounds very very full-on um and you you know from the outside looking in you give everything to what you do um what does your downtime look like or the, before you wait before you say what downtime whatever <laughs> downtime you can get um and yeah what what does that look like for you do you find it because something that I find really hard is switching off especially mm. when I finish teaching like you tonight about nine o'clock and then coming home and having to have something to eat. And then my mind is still like, ooh. How do you, yeah. how do you switch off? I agree. Um, well, now, uh, let's just say that uh, uh, now, since, since I started getting hip problems, I make more downtime for myself. Like of before course. that, there was downtime was sleeping, eating, and uh, maybe like a walk or... Uh, something like this um the the thing you say about after teaching that was very hard i i'm gonna say something that might you maybe you have to cut it out um but i'm dutch i uh i like to smoke weed um yeah. sometimes to get me down because that was exactly the thing not smoke by the way vape so it's like without smoke mm -hmm. it's basically just a um it's not bad for the lungs but i also had big problems teaching sometimes i would teach until 10 in the night mm -hmm. then and you know the studio you have to clean you have to send another email whatever do some training come home eat make sure you have something healthy you to nourish your body after the training so that take time and then like you said your brain is still like you're you're giving high energy in classes 
And it's very, it, you can't just show from high energy back to low energy uh, for sleeping. I tried many times to be like, okay, I'll just go to bed like early. You still have to take a shower and everything. You can't, but then like, I'll just you? be in bed like this. And, uh, and yeah. there's no, there's no relaxing. No. So I had like CBD or, uh, well, we just, uh, Help, help me just relax and what it, it just switches I mean, what it does basically it switches you off just relax your muscles yeah yeah it, slow, it slows your brain down and it's not like a you know a munch is kind of uh super high whatever but just helping the body come down a little bit and i i when i didn't do it um which it was obviously not consistent but um yeah, it's just, it's the body is just on high, high energy. Uh, the mind is on high energy and I would end up falling asleep at 3 a.m. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was too late, you know. And then the next day you wake up at 10 a.m. And it's just like, yeah, it was, it was too much. I find that very hard. So what I did now is uh, I just don't teach that much late classes anymore. My classes finish at 8.30. So I can be in bed at 11 or 12 latest. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I actually, it was something that I took the decision to do this year was make was make sure that I stopped teaching at a certain yeah. time because, you know, that half eight really is the cutoff point for me as well. You know, anything <laughs> beyond that, you start, you know, you take a class to like 20 to nine, quarter to nine, nine o'clock. You, like you say, by the time you get out, take the equipment down, clean everything that you need to do and then get home. And then even then, like trying to eat at that time of night is still difficult. Yeah, exactly. You can't you can't eat straight after uh, after two, three classes. You have to allow the body to find some rest for mm. digestion. Uh, yeah, your body still has to switch to that uh, to that mode. Yeah, it's the same for me. I can't eat straight after training either. No. After teaching. No. no. So. Um, do you do you look after yourself in terms of massage? Do you get regular sports treatments? Do you do you do anything like that? Not really. I just no. eat really, really healthy. I well, that was going to be sure. my next um, question, actually, on diet and eating. Mm-hmm. I don't. I know there's a big, big diet culture, and people take it in their own way. I lead a very healthy lifestyle. It makes me feel good. I feel great. I then don't get that slugginess. I don't get sugar crashes. And it's now a lifestyle for me. I, I really feel it if I don't drink water. Um, I just don't like the way it makes my body feel. And that's me personally. And that's what sort of diet means. It's not diet. It's a lifestyle for me. So how is it? F- oh, sorry. There's a giant fucking beetle. A beetle? <laughs> <I'm> so sorry. <laughs> it's enormous. Fuck. I'm I need to... <laughs> It's fucking crazy to me. Okay. Oh, okay. Wait, give me a second. I have to handle this situation because it's you gonna... handle Ooh. this situation. You handle this situation. No, it's coming right for me. I hate that. Why? You know when people say, "Oh, the bug is more scared of you than it is uh, than the other way around." It's a lie. It's Brit, a this lie. is going. This is going on Insta. This is going to okay. be my promo <laughs> clip. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay. I'm going to move to the other room. Wait. Wait. Okay. Fuck. Okay, horrible, horrible. And then tomorrow I'm gonna open the um, the room and it would be like a you know like a surprise <laughs> attack. Okay, I'm just here for it. Whew, that was very exciting. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, not, I'm gonna keep that on. That to just adds a <laughs> bit of spice to the podcast. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, <laughs> continue. All right. So. As I was saying, the uh, lifestyle and eating and stuff for you, you you just touched on it there. You lead a very nice, healthy lifestyle. So what does that mean for you? What do you have any like, do you have anything that you you live by? Yeah, well, my um, sleep. Sleep is very important. I guess yes. uh, at least seven and a half hours is uh, is my balance. Like if I go to sleep without an alarm, seven and a half hours later, I wake up rested. Uh, um and i'm good to go so that's that's the first thing um then uh absolutely what i eat um i do eat a lot of crap i love chocolate hey we all do love ice cream that's yeah uh, i don't go around that but i also make sure that i deliver all the things to my body that it needs so um vegetables 
vegetables, a lot of vegetable fruits. I think, uh, I don't know in percentage, but in a in like a normal regular weekday, I think seventy five percent of what I eat is uh, fruit and vegetables. Wow, that is yeah. really high. I I eat, I breakfast with fruit and oat yogurt. Yes, and like some some chia seeds uh, mm-hmm. stuff like this. Uh, my lunch is um, usually like um, it's not uh, wheat bread. It's like a healthy kind of bread with some uh, vegetable spreads. Uh-huh. And then um, during the week, I eat salads for dinner. So um, all veggies um, with like some nuts uh, or maybe some salmon or some egg just to get a little bit more protein. But um yeah, so that's like a regular, a regular day. Yeah. Uh, from yeah. Me. Don't worry, we all have those binge days. There oh, are yeah. days <laughs> when I'm like, I need, <laughs> I need some chocolate or yes. something like that. But then, you know, it's having that balance because I don't eat crap during the week. Monday to Friday for me has always been very, very disciplined. And even mm-hmm. the weekends used to be disciplined. And my husband, t- you know, really helped me get out of that mindset. And actually, you can just. You know, if I want a chocolate bar, I can just have a chocolate bar. But the weekends are very much relaxed for me versus the week. Um, yeah. But you're, but you know, like you say, you eat. It's about giving your body what it needs. Yes. The fruit and veg. Um. So something I do want to circle back to really quickly is your your hip and how you're how how you're recovering from that. In terms of what does your recovery look like? How are you building back up the flexibility? How are you building back up the strength? Um, or are you just taking it as it comes? And because you mentioned at the beginning that there's some things that you know you're going to be prevented from doing. Yeah. What 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 is that? Is there anything? Is there anything that's that you're a bit disappointed that you know you're not going to be able to do again? Um, it's kind of hard because it's hard to judge because there's no research on uh, pole dancers and uh, prosthetic you're hips. The, there you're are the guinea pig. some. Yes, I actually have three guinea guinea pigs, by the way. But uh, cute, uh, <laughs> cute, um, very. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, it's like a, a very much a learning curve. Now, my dad, of course, um, prepared me. He said, you know, you're replacing a natural part of your body, mm-hmm. and you cannot expect it to be the same after. There were all. It, it's not a miracle cure. Yeah, uh, knowing this, I already already um, I wouldn't say said goodbye to certain things, but I was very aware that I would have to take it as it comes. Um, yeah, I think if Which, you're accepting that point, of that, I think if you if yeah. you if you know that and you mm-hmm. mentally prepare yourself for mm-hmm. it, it yeah. can be a lot easier to digest information and accept the reality when you have accepted it yourself. Hmm. Yeah. And then it, whatever, what you know, like you say, whatever you can do will just be a bonus. The, yeah. And also it got to a point where I wouldn't be able to do much uh, in that direction anyway anymore because I was in so much pain that, you know, my, my range of motion was getting more and more limited anyway. Mm. But uh, so far what I haven't, I went to my physical therapist for a couple of sessions just because I know that if I would do it myself, I would over, overdo it. Yes, um, yes. Which well, I did at the beginning. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I must say everything felt right. Everything that I did, because I know my body very well. And afterwards, my dad warned me. Um, a little voice in my head still says, but I still don't think I did really anything wrong because I, it felt really stable. But mm. Of course, when you're still on vacation, yeah, you, you don't, you can't really have a sense for what your what your body is doing. So it, it's basically just a process. What I'm very happy is that I have my middle splits uh, back, and they wow. feel good. I still have to be careful, but because I use a lot of active flex, it's good. My front split, hmm, not looking very good. Um, on my good side, I think I will get it completely back. On my bad side, it's. Uh, Mm. Well, it's still what, a what process your, what's your good leg you left or right split. my left leg forward so that would mean my prosthetic hip in the back that seems uh-huh. to work uh, the other way around is a little bit more difficult so I'm having my hip flexor uh, hip flexors are um, um, 
there, there is a limitation and I'm not sure if it's muscular yet or uh, if it's like a, a prosthetic hip thing, but that's something my, my surgeon also said, it takes up to four months, you know, you have to, before you start getting a sense of what is gonna uh, be possible and whatnot, so. Well, even looking from the outside, I must, even though I, I joked around and said, we watched how quickly you bounced back from that hip surgery, it didn't ever look uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. it, you wouldn't have even known like you said you know like you were in complete control of your body and I think that was one of the most like astonishing things to to watch because it was like wow even when you were you were walking pretty quick after your surgery I'm not that's, a stalker that's by relatively the way I saw normal. all this on Instagram <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, that's actually, it's relatively, uh, I wouldn't say, no, yeah, well, normal because okay. um, you're uh, supposed to start working the day after you get the hip replacement surgery because um, it's uh, after surgery, you can put an actual load on it immediately. So, wow. uh, you know, walking is, is, it's just a mechanical replacement. So yes, that works, especially if you have good pain medication, because that's, that's definitely necessary. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the walking is, but getting like a smoothness in the walk, that's of course uh, something that takes some time and practice and it's easier because I'm relatively relatively young in compared to other. Um, yes, you patients. are. You really <laughs> are. Yeah, on the ward, they must have been like, who is this woman? <laughs> yeah, they asked me, is there, are you coming here for surgery yourself? Or are you coming? We I mean, don't take visitors. It's Corona time. So no, I'm actually <laughs> doing surgery myself. Yeah. yeah, that must have been unbelievable. Yeah. Well, just to finish off, for anybody listening that's like starting their pole journey, what would your what would your tips be to anybody? Yeah, starting their journey, wanting to build their strength and flexibility. What what are Brit Bloom's tips? Uh, I think the most important one is keep if you want to, you know, uh, reach a certain level, keep pushing, keep pushing, even on the days where it feels like nothing is happening and not nothing is improving keeping because eventually if you keep pushing you will get better and the second one is enjoy it because absolutely i mean keep pushing is is if you have like certain goals but the main thing should still be just enjoy yourself don't compare yourself to others ever find what you're good at and just enjoy that to the maximum i think that's such a lovely piece of advice you can get so caught up in that like mm -hmm. you, people don't understand different levels of flexibility and strength and some people it comes so natural to and some people it doesn't and this is why you can just never compare yourself mm -hmm. you'll never be happy otherwise no and, and it goes everybody you know you know what it's like if you see someone on stage and they are just you know doing their thing their thing it's so captivating and then you you couldn't care less if someone has like a 180 degree split or no split at all if they if, if you can see what a person is about and they bring that in their in their pole dancing or their dancing that for me is the essence of what makes something interesting or beautiful you know and that's also when someone is really enjoying themselves um yeah it's captivating isn't it yeah very much well Britt thank you so much for joining me I will let you now start your downtime <laughs> thank you very much it's thank been very you. It's nice been, it's been an absolute pleasure it really really has thank you so so much thank you